point of view, a sponsor. Point of View is sponsored by First National Bank. First National Bank, how can we help you? The Point of View is brought to you by Cowbell Coffee. Cowbell Coffee, taste it, love it. Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television here in Ghana. On The Point of View, we usually get the right guests, ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. But every now and again, we pick a very topical issue and we tell you what we think of that matter. We break it down, we give you the various angles, and we give an opinion at the end. Tonight is one of such nights. I'm going to be talking about the fix the country hashtag and what it's become. It's going to be serious. Stay with me. Don't forget, the point of view is brought to you by First National Bank. How can we help you? And Cowbell Coffee. Taste it. Love it. Tonight, my focus is on the hashtag fix the country or fix the country now. It's been trending for quite a while. And tonight, I'm going to tell you six things. First, what is this? Is it just a social media campaign? Is it a movement? Is it a pressure group? Is it a revolution? What is it? Then we'll talk about who is or who are behind it. Is it one person? Is it three people? Is it a thousand people? Who are they? Then would, would, would ask, what are their main concerns? Because I'm sure you've been following the news, listening to people saying different things. What really do they want? Then I would answer another question. Why are they so angry? Because on radio we interview people and some people are very upset about lots of things going on. So try and isolate the key reasons why they are angry. Then later on, I'll try and compare what is happening with Fix the Country with what's happened before. So in case you didn't know this, seven years ago, there was something similar that happened. It started with a match on the Flagstaff House, culminated in many things. So I'll compare and contrast the two. And then later on, I will give my advice to the people behind the Fix the Country campaign and also my peace of mind to the government. So that's what I'll be doing tonight. Now, it's a live show. I'm live, so you can send me your comments whether you agree with me or not, if you're part of the campaign, let me hear from you. We're going to be going from now till 10 o'clock. So let's start with some numbers. So we have not seen this in a while. A few hours before we got on air, the number of tweets with the hashtag fix the country or fix the country now was over 650,000. Now, what does that mean? I'll explain it. So we have about 8.2 million Ghanaians on social media, about 7 million are on Facebook, about 695,000 are on Twitter. So to get a hashtag fix the country now with 660,000 tweets is serious. Now, that doesn't mean 660,000 people have written about it. It just means that the there's been 660,000 occurrences of that phrase or those two phrases, fix the country, fix the country now. What does that mean? So there's a difference between occurrence and impression. So if you, if you, if you do a little thing, you realize that you can multiply the occurrences by probably 23 or 24, sometimes 26 times to give you the real impression. So you're talking about 17 million impressions for fix the country now. That suggests that 
If you look at the symbiosis between Facebook and Twitter, a lot of people have seen this. So even though Twitter doesn't have up to a million people, you can't underestimate the significance and the power of this. We haven't seen a specific phrase get this many tweets in a long time. You will typically see tweets on football, on politics and things. And this is not really even a political year. So this is big. This is really, really big. 660,000 tweets and counting is really, really big. Again, if you contrast that to other, for example, today, some of the main trends have not even gone beyond 20,000. So this is big. And this has been just a week. In just one week, you've had almost 700,000 tweets saying fix the country. If you multiply that by 26, the, the, the reach is serious. So the, the, the difference between the impression and the reach, the reach is in the millions. So that's the first issue. So this is, you can't take this lightly. Second issue, who is behind it? So there are a few people who've been tweeting, but the main person who initiated the tweet is a young man they call Kali J. I'll show you his picture. Yeah, he's a, he's a young guy. And um, yeah, he's not necessarily a celebrity. He's an ordinary person, you know. And he... To be fair, even though he's not a celebrity, there's been one other person who's also been tweeting quite seriously and talking about this. She's called Ifia Odo. I'm sure you've seen her before. She's actually done a few videos as well. But this is the guy who put the, this together. Okay? They call him Kali J. We'll use him. This is Ifia Odo. I think you can call her a socialite. I've seen a few videos of her wondering why anybody would attack somebody for saying they should fix their country. And she basically says, anybody who has a problem with fix the country campaign either is being paid or has a problem in up there up there and she has a lot of followers i remember one, one short video she put out almost five thousand likes so she's fairly followed so these are not necessarily big people in the non-social sphere these are more social media people in fact kali J has over three hundred and eighty thousand followers on twitter Right, so he, he is not that small. If you think about certain media houses don't even have 200,000 followers and he has 380,000 followers on Twitter. So clearly he understands the way social media works. Okay, we won't talk too much about him now and I'll explain why. We don't know whether he, he is a, a banker or he's, but he's a fairly ordinary Ghanaian young man. He's been interviewed by a few people. All right, now let me give you a quick flavor of what their concerns are. Okay, so what have they been saying? It's a whole range of things. We've just selected some choice tweets to give you a sense. So, for example, somebody called Aziz tweets 11 hours, this is about 12 hours ago, says, Cement is 49 cities and you want me to be happy? Fix the country now. Fix the country. Nice photo he puts there. So, this is suggesting cost of living. Cement to, buy, to build a house. Look at another one. Somebody called Hova. He tweets at Hova Jr. This is uh, yesterday. Children that will lead Ghana tomorrow will be drinking the water, I feel a great pain in me now. Fix the country. So they are talking about lack of access to water. So poverty. So high cost of living. Poverty. Look at this one. We discussed this on radio a few weeks ago. This is Meister Mind. He tweets again yesterday, 547. The number of boys gathered at every traffic light in East Legon, just giving you funds and chasing your car for money simply tells what's happening in the country. Again, they are talking about Poverty, they're talking about urban sprawl and its concomitant social problems. Then here's somebody tweeting parts of Stone Boys. Where, tell me where you're going to run, go. So he says, you are amassing wealth for your greedy selves and you making it a living hell. When poor people rise up one day, we're going to revolt against your duty system. We not go in, we not go in, we outside, we outside. So this is this person, and again, as the hashtag fix the country. So Stoneboy echo, and again, we'll talk about the music as well. Stoneboy seems to re-echo some of these things in his songs. Somebody called Micah Fuakwa simply tweets the Arise Ghana Youth for Your Country. So there's a lot of despondency kind of tweets, like things are not going well. There's also tweets trying to rally people. So like this one. Arise, Ghana youth for your country. The nation demands your devotion. You remember this song? Let us all unite and uphold us. So some of it is saying we are not happy what is going on. Others are saying, young people, let's come together. Fix the country. Fix the country now. Fix this country. All right? And this is uh, uh, from somebody called Mike Afuakwa. He tweets with this very poignant, Arise, Ghana youth for your country. Now, 
Other individuals have tweeted. There's an interesting tweet that came from a group. Yes, before we get to that one. Look at this one. You've tightened the educational system to the extent that even if you passed all the subjects and failed one, which is core match, you won't be allowed to go to school. Yet till the, you, yet till, till the youth will manage to go through everything and complete school without a job. So unemployment. So we've spoken about high cost of living, poverty, social problems. Now they're talking about unemployment. Serious issue. That's from Randy. Now, we're, we're talking, we'll come to this one later. This, this is not what I want to read. Let's, let's deal with, um, yes, stats GH. I, I thought this was interesting. This is essentially complaining about road accidents. So it's a wide range of issues. Road accidents, deaths between January and April this year, claimed 771 people. And this is a group, not an individual, stats GH. Don't look at it statistically. Know that each of these 771 individuals is a loved one. Again, City News tweeted this and compared this to COVID. This was just in three months. COVID for the whole year hadn't killed up to 771. Fixed the country. So they are listing a lot of problems. Now, one of the most fascinating threats we've seen on this was posted by the, the, the handle of a group that tweets for Mencia. Okay, so they, they tweet for the, they, they share news about the Ashanti kingdom. Okay, and they listed 17 things they wanted done. I mean, that was quite interesting. So if you follow this Twitter handle, they usually talk about the uh, Ashanti and what he's doing and things. So this is a group. I, I don't know whether it's official Mencia, but a lot of the, they have the Mencia colors on there, yellow and green and black. And they have Otun Force videos there. Everything you want to know, Mensha is there. So this, this, this is not an individual. This is like a group. Now look at what they're saying. Mr. President, please don't forget to fix KJTR. And this is yesterday. Look at the things they list. KJTR phase two, you cut the sword for. Buankra Inland Port. Kumasi Obuasi Railway. Suyame Interchange, you promised. Ofori Chrome. Bekwai Runabout, you promised. Abandoned Sofola Interchange. It's like you are listening to the City Breakfast Show and Kojo is talking. Abandoned KNUST Teaching Hospital, you promised. Afari. He's listing abandoned projects. He's listing uncompleted roads, or they are listing. Okay? And keep going. And this is yesterday. Abandoned Kumo Hospital, Crow Road Market, Tanosu Dual Carriage Road, the Conference Center, your former creative minister, Kat for All the Ashanti roads you promised. Thank you. Fix the country. So this is not just some faceless <laughs> upstarts. Okay? I don't think that this Twitter handle that tweets serious stuff about Menshia. For example, when Otunfo's mother was dead and they started doing their, their rights, this Twitter handle gave us, I followed it, gave us many, many updates on what's happening in Ashanti. There are some very, very good photos from Menshia. So clearly, they are connected to Menshia in a way. And they've put out 17 things they are asking the president to do, and they are using the hashtag fix the country. So it, it's not just some faceless people. We've seen bodies. I've seen journalists, Johnny Hughes, TV3. Uh, He's been tweeting with this, Gary Al Smith, you know, some of our own journalists here. So it's, it's, it's very, it's growing very rapidly. And if you think that it's just been a week, it's very serious. Okay. So this, this are what your concerns are. But there are so many. We've listed the concerns into about, I don't know, probably 20 things. So economy, under that you have unemployment, you have high cost of living, you have tariff increases, tax increases, complaining about fuel prices, complaining about the proposed increase in tariffs for OTT and talk time. Okay? They're talking about bad roads, healthcare, poor education, all kinds of things. So it's very broad. There's so many issues, but it's generally people are not happy with what's going on. I think you can say there is a dissatisfaction with political leadership. That's just generally what you see, a dissatisfaction with political leadership. But there's a very important question we need to answer. Why are they so angry? And some of the tweets I'll show you will show the anger. But I've seen very, very angry people say very, very unprintable things. I think there are four reasons why these guys are angry. We've tried to isolate the reasons into four. I think one of the main reasons why people are angry with this government in particular is that they had a lot of hope in the government. Okay, so we talk about unfulfilled promises. 
let me show you some of the things the president said in 2016 before the, the election, just quickly, to give you a sense of why the anger has built up. Because, for example, December 1, seven days to election 2016, God did not put us on this rich land to be poor. It is bad leadership that makes us poor. Vote Akufuado for visionary leadership. So he's, he's basically endorsing the position that if I don't have food to eat, if I don't have money, if I am poor, it's the leader I should blame. Look at this one. We are unhappy and dissatisfied with the conditions of our lives, yet government propagandists tell us we are living today in better times. This is 2016. Okay? I've seen how drivers, both private and commercial, struggle to pay for the high prices of fuel and insurance premiums. He's touching on some of the issues people are raising and that fix our country. Look at this. Many young people have been to school and yet have qualifications but no employment. Unemployment, 2016. We are told that 100,000 university graduates are trained. No job. Look at this. You mentioned Mahama, people think Doomsaw. When you mention Kufu, people think economic development. This is serious stuff. And this is 2016. So there's a feeling that the president and the MPP promised a lot. People had a lot of hope in this particular government. Okay, so he mentioned Doomsaw there. People are talking about Doomsaw as well. All right? Now, in terms of promises, Dr. Baumia, the vice president, let me just show you a flavor of some of the things he said, which is gen And in fact, these things I'm showing you, people are reposting them. This particular one, I've seen it posted so many times with Face the Country. Look at this. NDC has resorted to increasing taxes under the economic difficulties they, increased, they created. And every government will do different. Well, the recent budget imposed COVID health levy, 1% on VAT, flat rate scheme, 1% NHL. They imposed almost 60 pesos petroleum price increase. We are paying over six cities now. Sanitation and pollution levy. Now they're saying, Dr. Baumia, you said this in 2016. So why are you increasing taxes at this time? They even have videos. Again, if you go to the Fix the Country hashtag, there's a, a couple of videos that are really just going all over the place. All right, I think I have one of them. He was in Joy FM talking about the NDC government's economic agenda. And he was basically saying, it's a vicious circle of economic mismanagement. That's what he was saying. He was saying, it's a vicious circle of economic mismanagement. Now, the reason this is interesting is that the examples he cites are things people see today, which is what is making them angry. So let me show you what Dr. Bamiya said. I, don't, I think this is 2016-ish. This is what he said. All of these are hurting. Mm. They are hurting the economy. These taxes are hurting. And therefore, you are not going to get the growth. And when you don't get the growth, you will not get the revenue. And when you don't get the revenue, you go back to increasing taxes to get the revenue. And then mm. you are in a, a cyclical downward spiral. Mm. And, and so they have it wrong. And we will change that that particular policy. Uh, we will use the tax incentives to grow this economy. And you... Uh, all of these are hurting. Mm. They are hurting the economy. These taxes are hurting. And therefore, you are not going to get the growth. And when you don't get the growth, you will not get the revenue. And when you don't get the revenue, you go back to increasing taxes to get the revenue. And then mm. you are in a, a cyclical downward spiral. Mm. And, and so they have it wrong. And we will change that, that particular policy. Uh, we will use the tax incentives. So, so you heard that. So it's basically talking about the taxation. And the other issue about the taxation is that people like Joe Jackson have said the recent tax announcements in the budget are retrogressive. A retrogressive tax is simply a tax that affects the poor disproportionately. Now, a lot of the taxes government has imposed are consumption taxes. So you're talking about a VAT NHL. So you go and buy a bottle of water. Maybe the bottle of water is two CDs, but you pay 2.15 because of 15% VAT or whatever. Now, if a rich man has a million CDs, that 1.5 is nothing. But if somebody earns 10 CDs, that's a lot. So it's retrogressive, right? So, and the point he was making was that the government is forced. And don't forget, at the time, Setekpe had introduced all these taxes. They call nuisance taxes, tax on condom, tax on all kinds of chaliwate and things. And people were so angry. Then they also introduced a special petroleum tax. At the time, it was over 17 pesos. And I remember Kweku Kwati and Ko were so upset. Why are you introducing a special petroleum tax with all the tax build up in the price? Now, if you look at the tax in increases, COVID health levy, VAT flat rate scheme, sanitation pollution levy, it was on the petroleum products. Energy sector, 
recovery levy, delta fund, 20 pesos. All right, so if you think about that, and you hear Dr. Bamiya talking about this, clearly people will be upset. Okay, and they're saying the taxes are retrogressive. Fuel prices have gone up. VAT and all these things have gone up. Then there's also the vexed issue. The second reason people are angry is power issues. I think Ghanaians have a very low tolerance for heat. So when the light goes off, they don't like it at all, at all. In fact, we have a series of stories on City Newsroom on Doomsaw between just in the month of March, the Doomsaw 2021 crisis, what we know so far, you'll be shocked. The, 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 <laughs> so let me give you a quick flavor. Blackouts and explanations from Greco between March the 3rd and April the 4th, just one month. Good. Since the beginning of the year, Greco has through statements, given explanations on six separate power outages. The ECG also issued a statement to that regard. In that regard, March 3, Gridco said closure of an emergency valve at the West Africa gas pipeline was to blame for power cuts in parts of Accra that day. According to the company, the action ended up curtailing gas supply to some generating plants in the country. This is March 3. Four days later, March 7, a challenge in Gridco's power system led to a total system shutdown and total power outage nationwide. This led to an interruption in power supply to all parts of the country. This is March 7, day after independence. Then March 8, the total power system shutdown that was experienced that day was due to a technical fault on one of the major transmission lines between Presti and Oboase. According to Gridco, in line with the challenges, Ghana Highway Authority announced that sections of N1, N2, N4 highways were experiencing some minimum to maximum disruptions. A week later, March 16, the day before, March 15, there was power cut in parts of the national capital Accra. ECG blamed the outage on technical challenges from Gridco in a communique. ECG explained that the outage being experienced in parts of Accra and ECG operational areas was due to challenges from Gridco. March 17, power supply to parts of Volta region interrupted for five days due to Gridco's extensive maintenance work. March 24, power transmission company indicates that a technical fault upstream was responsible for outage experienced in parts of Accra West Winneba Techiman Sunyani. A statement Gridco said the power outage was reported by the Ghana Gas Company, which said there was a compressor fault upstream. People don't understand all these things. Compressor, system update, they don't understand. Leading to 750 megawatts of system loss. April 4, the latest of the power cuts, Gridco attributed to technical problem. This is just one month. I've mentioned how many? One, March 3, March 7, March 8, March 16, March 17, March 24, April 4. About six. Okay. Now, if you listen to Ghanaians, and we don't have time to show you this. Businessmen in Kumasi, give us a low shedding timetable. Businessmen in Accra. They feel you are hiding something. I interviewed a Greek CEO. He says, we will never return to Dumsor. Minister says, what we are going through is not the same as the John Muhammad Dumsor. Well, we don't care. We just, we just need the light. Okay? So that's one of the reasons why Angus like, you are telling us, oh, in fact, there's a story I saw which was quite interesting. Um, this, September 14, 2020, Mustafa Hamid, Dumsor will be back if Muhammad wins the polls. This is a story written by Ernest Info. Serious story. And this is Mustafa Hamid, our good friend, OJ's friend. I mean, he was addressing a press conference in Accra September 14. Deputy campaign manager of MPP, Mustafa Hamid, said, under the Muhammad government, Ghanaians slept in darkness for 1,188 hours. So then he goes on to say that that was throughout the administration. But when they came to power in 2017, the power went off for how many? Um, 41 hours, 7 minutes. So if they, if they should tell us they resolved the doom so where did we get 800 hours of power take from so these kinds of things is what right people ah you are telling us mahama caused doom so and now when you, you come there will be no doom so we've had six power outages in how many days so people are angry so when you touch water and power people are not happy so that's the second issue now the third reason why people are angry is the government response now there were a couple of things that happened whilst the fix the country hashtag was trending Two days later, a couple of things started trending. Fix yourself started trending. Fix your attitude. Ghana is being fixed. Nana is fixing it. I think the, 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 the straw that broke the camel's back was a tweet the MP for Sao Madrid put out. He's the majority chief whip in parliament, a former student leader, and a well-respected politician. Now, he put something on Twitter that got people so angry. Now, I just want to show it to you. <laughs> and this is under the fix yourself, fix your attitude, Ghana is being fixed line of things. I mean, he essentially posted that 
Why are you busy? Why are you talking about fix the country? Have you fixed? Have you fixed? He, he mentioned so many times. I wish I wish I had it. Have you fixed um, your attitude? Have you paid your taxes? You know, I mean, it, it was serious. You know, he 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 really went for Ghanaians. Look, the barrage of accusations against him. I know the prayer had to come back and apologize. I really wish I had that. I know the prayer had to come back and apologize because. He was basically telling Ghanaians that, what are you saying? We should fix the country. Have you fixed yourself? Check yourself. That got Ghanaians angry. And I think the last reason Ghanaians are angry is the unemployment crisis. Now, we shouldn't downplay unemployment. It's not just COVID. We are told that by TUC that 800,000 people lost their jobs during COVID. Now, before COVID, we had about seven banks that collapsed. About 22 savings and loans and microfinance companies collapsed. About 354 microfinance companies collapsed. Even if those companies employ just 10 people each, it might look at the numbers. So this is not even just COVID matter. And this is unemployment. In the, look, if a bank closes, it's not just the bank manager that loses his job. From bank teller to security man to the person who brings them watching in the afternoon to the person who, who services their AC, all lose their jobs. So the unemployment crisis was there, exacerbated by COVID. And then now you have taxes and things coming in. So people are angry. Your university graduates you produce, the government says, but between now and 2030, we're going to have about 350,000 university graduates come out of school. Even 110,000 graduates, they are not getting work to do. This is why people are angry. Now, there have been some reactions to this. A couple of people have said, this is just Occupy Ghana coming back. In fact, there have been three or four tweets around this, like, oh, Occupy Ghana, NDC people. They have used Fix the Country to behave like Occupy Ghana some seven years ago. When I come back, I'm going to explain to you the similarities and differences between what is going on now and what happened in 2014, 2015. I'm going to do that when I come back. And then when I'm done with all of this, I'll give some free advice to both the organizers and government. But I want to show you a quick video of Ghanaians talking about how much they earn, which encapsulates the, the economic challenges they face. This was just last week during the May Day celebrations. We're talking about minimum wage. Just listen to this report put together by one of our team members, Na Adule Mufat. When you came to Accra to look for a job, why? Um, just to take care of myself and make life easy with me. Florence Odei Adibu is a senior high school graduate who traveled all the way from Latte to Accra after school in search of a job. Since arriving in Accra, she's done several jobs, including being a house help and a waitress to make ends meet. But life has not been rosy, forcing her to quit several times to search for something more rewarding. Currently, she works as a laundry shop attendant. They pay me um, $3.50, though it's not enough, but I'm managing it. Since because of the COVID, there's no job, so I'm trying to manage it small. But Florence tells me she practically survives every month on just 150 Ghana CDs by putting aside 200 CDs out of the meager 350 CDs as savings with the hope to further her education soon. I want to be a midwife and that is my ambition that I've planned a um, long time ago. So that is why I'm doing this job just to manage it and further my education. With the country's minimum wage currently at 11 cities 82 pesos, translating into a little above $2 a day, Ghana's minimum wage is one of the lowest in West Africa. Despite moves by authorities to ensure that the minimum wage is reasonable enough for Ghanaians, it appears the country's economic challenges and realities make it difficult. Indebtedness, empty bank accounts and harsh living conditions are the common challenges majority of Ghana's minimum wage earners face in both public and private sectors. Some security guards in the private sector also shared their experiences with City Business News on grounds of anonymity. One of them, who has worked for five years as a security guard, earns 400 CDs a month. In and out, every day is a nine CD. Nine CD. If you are times uh, thirty-one days, thirty days is uh, more than two hundred Ghana CDs a month. 
So, uh, and then how much money do you spend on food as well? Food, uh, left that amount that left about 200 and something Ghana cities. That's the one that I used to spend for the food. So do you have ch do you have a family, do you have a wife, do you have children? How do you cater for them with the money that you are given at the end of every month? Uh, if the month, uh, the one that they give to me, and if I did have that one inside the transportation and all those things, that's one one that you, uh, you can manage this one before later on. Of our company, they give us a uh, salary advance for uh, half, half, half of the month. They give salary advance. So you can use that one to support yourself before the month will end again. If you work even yourself, you can't keep any money in the bank. The other, however, earns 850 CDs a month. He tells me he only earns that amount because he has worked for 15 years and is considered a senior security guard in the company. Are you able to save some for future, anything that can happen in the future? That one, there, I can tell, I can confidently tell you no. Confidently, I'll tell you no. Because how much is the money? How much, do you, how, how much will you earn? Will you use? And then how much will be left for you to save? Unless maybe a miracle, miracle, maybe if you win a lot too. And then maybe you can say you, you save some. But aside that, there you can't well, well, you can save money. So, I mean, do you get scared of the future? Do you get scared that, hey, what if something very, God forbid, but what if something very unexpected happens? Yes, that what, 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 mm -hmm. what you are talking about, about what you are talking about, want to talk. I always, I think about it every day. But as I'm sitting here now, I always my ask myself, right now, I don't have any property. What of you today? I'm gone. My children, what are you going to do? That is the question I ask myself every day, every single day I ask myself. Workers in the construction sector, unlike many others, are mostly paid on a weekly basis. Although what they earn in a month is relatively better, they say it's not enough. Let me see, transport and... The food that we buy now almost takes our money, so you cannot even uh, save. So, do you have a family? Do you have a wife? Yeah. I actually have a family so I ha a wife and a kid, one son. Okay. So, how, how do you, I mean, you're saying the money is not enough for you, how do you take care of them? Well, whatever we get, that's what we will, we will spend. Sometimes, when I'm, I'm giving the money, because I don't want to waste it, before going to the house, I sometimes pass to the market buy some foodstuffs and things. So the rest that I will left, I will give it to my wife to also use it in the house. The rest, I will also take off my transport for the week. No good. No good. Mm, wake up. <laughs> Why? Pen will be pro. Pen no, no good. And this one, I, I did every time. I don't get job. This job, I'll work. I'll come across this job, I'll come for work. Yeah, so those were some workers. Very serious, you know. The amount of money they are mentioning, nine CDs per day and stuff like this. And um, this is Ellen Dapas report, by the way, not now the Ellen Dapas report. It says Ghana's minimum wage is one of the lowest in West Africa. So when you see this and then you sort of compare it to what another employer will say, let me just show you what he said, just to, to, to give it clarity, okay? Take good notice of these two. Fix the country, fix the country, Jimmy. You don't pay your taxes. Your polit you politicize every good policy. You receive bribe. You enjoy illegal connections. You don't respect your elders. You overprice your products and services. You destroy state properties, on and on and on. This really got people riled up. I mean, Gary Al Smith posted something. I don't know if I will show it. it he was so upset. He showed me Gary Al Smith. He's a, a colleague journalist. After spending most of Yesterday, telling us, fix yourself and fix your attitude. They've noticed that this isn't a good response. So it is now Nana is fixing it and Ghana is being fixed. I want to say Nana is fixing expletive, but it's too early. Just fix the country because you've got the power. Now, he was reacting to somebody called Nana Yamantiao, who I think works at the Jubilee House, who says Ghana is not a failed state. And some of the stuff that Anodon Prayer and co-tweeted. And he said Anodon Prayer has come to apologize for his tweet. But this is why people are angry.
The, the third reason is government's response and then the unemployment. Now, when I come back, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to discuss quickly the similarities and differences between what is going on and what happened with Occupy Flagstaff House, whether it's the same thing that's reincarnating itself. Then I have some free advice for the organizers and I have some free advice for the government as well. This is the point of view, especially editorial on Fix the Country Now. We'll be right back. to meet every challenge it's a good day to want more out of life it's a good day to wish for it work for it go get it familiar taste a delicious indulgent with a flavor you just can't hide refreshing energy gives so much for so little for a strong performance you've come to the right place good day energy drink why wait a minute to enjoy a good day when every second counts? Good Day Energy Drink keeps you going. Excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women, and people sensitive to caffeine. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight is an editorial on Fix the Country, Fix the Country Now, a hashtag that has received over 660,000 tweets with many, many millions of impressions. We're talking about who the people are behind this, what are their concerns, why are they so angry. Now, there have been a couple of things that have come up. I've seen people say this is actually Occupy Ghana or Occupy Flagstaff House reincarnated. A couple of people have said this. Okay, some people are saying, oh, it will end up political. Now, I'm not going to say whether that's true or not. I just want to show you what some people are saying. And I'm going to explain what we see as the differences and similarities between the two. Okay? Because Occupy Flagstaff House occurred in 2014. But here's somebody, Rabiu Alassan. He says, Occupy Ghana has forever sowed a seed of doubt in the minds and hearts of the public. We will wait for a long time. We will for a long time be deeply cynical about any social movement that seeks to hold government accountable. What well, Occupy Ghana did is plain evil. So there's a lot of people feel Occupy Ghana came and, and got conned us, essentially, to support a cause, only for most of them to end up becoming politicians. Look at this one for Mustafa. Fix the country's NDC's version of Occupy Ghana. There's a hidden interest somewhere. Shine your eyes. There are a few more. Okay, and this is just a couple of days ago. Somebody called Amankwa says, Media, I'm just asking you, know, is Occupy Ghana and Alliance for Accountable Governance still in Ghana or have they gone into hibernation? Ghana, no, no. Okay, this is AFAG. Okay, so what is Occupy Ghana? Let me do a quick historical analysis for you. In the year 2011, a Canadian newspaper wrote an article about growing inequality in the world. When they wrote the article, a lot of university students read it and were happy because in the US, most working people who have gone to a university owe student loans, and they call themselves the 99%. This was just a couple of years after the financial crisis of 2009, where Wall Street had gone best, subprime mortgage. Banks privatize profits, and they make public their losses. People were angry with Wall Street. So for a period of three months, people went to sit in New York City, a specific part of New York City, and the police had to arrest them for them to move. This was 2011 for a few weeks into 2012. It was called the Occupy Wall Street movement. Now, there were various iterations of this. So Nigeria started, Occupy Lagos, Cameroonians started, people started. Now, Ghana didn't really hook on to this until around 2014. What happened in 2014? So there were lots of things. Doomsaw was in this major zenith at the time. Yvonne Nelson, an actor, led a group of people to organize a demonstration. Doomsome has stopped. But before that, there was a match by some people. They had a very interesting name. They were called Concerned Ghanaians for Responsible Governance. 
They marched to the, they wanted to march to the Flagstaff House to present a petition to President Mahama. What were their concerns? I'll show you their concerns. They were 20. Now, they sent a petition on 1st July 2014 to the Flagstaff House. Guess who received it? Valerie Sawyer, Deputy Chief of Staff. What were their concerns? It's a long letter they wrote to President Mahama, but they said, look at it, erratic power supply. That's the first one, erratic power supply. Nationwide, also known as Doomsaw. Two, unreliable supply of potable water across the country. Constant increases in taxes. Depreciating city. Inefficient revenue collection. Poor road network. Increment in utility tariffs. Frequent increase in what? Price of petroleum products. Government inability to make statutory payments timelessly. Government inability to address labor related issues. Government inability to exhibit decisive leadership in fight against corruption. 13, over politicization of socioeconomic issues. 14, government inability to create jobs. 15, small scale mining, Galamse. 16, improper administrative decisions. Lack of proper communication skills on part of government officials. Non passage of RTI. Non implementation of century consensus. Government ability to tackle perennial flooding. This was 1st July 2014. The group was called CRGD, Concerned Ghanaians for Responsible Governance. So this, this, the hashtag they used was called Occupy Flagstaff House, borrowing from Occupy Wall Street. So far, so good. In fact, there's a story, there's a news item written on a website called um, OK Africa, where they show some of the people who were, went on that protest. Okay. Now, there's some very interesting faces there. If you move it down a bit, the gentleman second to your left is called Kore Suman. I'll come back to Kore Suman later. God, now he works with the president. I know some of the guys on the shot, they are not necessarily MPP people at the time. So there was Donald, there's Atu, Ozenapia, there's Edadamate Tego. These are technology guys, social media guys. But Kore Suman was a young lawyer at the time. Okay. Fast forward. By May 2015, you had the social media campaign had evolved into a couple of demonstrations and then had become pressure group. Okay, so there's a trajectory there. So you have a, a, a social media campaign. It leads to a couple of demonstrations and then it becomes a pressure group. Then the politicians take over. Now, the pressure group that was formed was initially called Occupy Ghana. Later on, it split to become Citizen Ghana and Occupy Ghana. All right? Now, why am I saying all these things? So, it started organically. They did, I mean, Yvonne Nelson and co., they were not necessarily doing politics at the time. But what tends to happen, and what did happen, was that as soon as it gained form and gained traction, the political people took over. Okay? So, now I'm going to show you um, the, the, the characters and the people who sort of, became the faces of Occupy Ghana. They, some of them were not even there when the whole thing started. All right? So it wasn't as if they orchestrated in the background. See, Nikes Leopold, see the member of Occupy Ghana. Yofi Grant is working in government now. George Anda, former minister. Is Ankuma is still a private lawyer. Philip Ayensu is the PDS guy. George Enti, he works with um, uh, Standards Authority. So he's an appointee. Kathleen Addy, appointee. So George Enti, Kathleen Addy, Citizen Ghana. Uh, Sydney is George Anda, Occupy Ghana. A couple, only a couple of them have been taken positions. Most of them became so. The, the MPP took over. This is essentially what happened. Okay? So it did not necessarily start as a partisan thing, but it evolved from a social media campaign. Show me the, the evolution thing social media campaign to a few demonstrations to a pressure group, full blown politics. This is what happened. This is why people are saying. This is going to end up the same way. But let me show you the differences. There are a couple of differences. So the first thing, Occupy Ghana, Occupy Flagstaff House started before an election. This fix the country has started after an election. It's not the same. One is two years before an election. The other is one year after an election. Occupy became serious by 2015 May, a year to December 2020, December 2016 election. The momentum was against the government. This is... Immediately after an election. Number two, the context. It was a global Occupy uh, Wall Street that later on occupied Nigeria, occupied this, occupied that, occupied Ghana. In Ghana, this is, the country is not the same. We are not imitating anybody. 
You may say it's imitating the Arab Spring, but this is a bit different, okay? But the issues are the same. Doomso is there. Cost of living is there. Corruption is there. So the point is that these are structural political governance issues. Structural political governance issues, which the MPP promised to fix, but I found it very tough. Celebrities, Sarko Dier, Yvonne Nelson, now we have a few outdoor, not many, but I'm sure they will join. So these are the, it's not the same, but it's the same. In a sense that it all starts like this. Now, I'm not saying that this is a NDC thing, but I'm saying that the organizers have to be minded of this Occupy Flagstaff House and what happened to it. They have to be minded. You cannot ignore this immediate history. Yes, it started organically. There were so many people involved. I remember Bridget Jogbenuku and co. They marched to the Flagstaff House, presented their... I think Omani Bama had gone to receive the petition. They were hooting. All kinds of things. It started organically. But the, the, the issue is that it doesn't end organically. It started organically. So let me give a few pieces of advice to the organizers. And I don't even know if they are organizers or instigators or catalysts because it's almost like a leaderless revolution. Beware of the partisan takeover because that's what happened with the 2014 issue. It started with people who articulated 20 genuine issues. And when we look through the issues you're articulating, they are genuine. But trust me, the politicians are circling. They are smelling blood. They are thinking about this. They want to be part of it. You have to be very careful. Now, I can't emphasize this point enough because... Whereas there's anger, which is important to bring change, you need to be sure who the opponent is. So is this just MPP you are fighting or you are fighting the political class? Are you dealing with just the Nana Kufado government or you're saying all politicians or you're saying, well, you are in power. You, you promised so many things. Fix it now. That's solid. But you, you could also end up becoming, you know what? They failed. Let's vote to another party. There's nothing wrong with that. But just be careful. Okay? You need to think about this carefully. The other issue is this. You, you need to think institutionally. I need to explain this point. So Obama says we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, focus on strong men. We need strong institutions. I agree. But somebody says, even though you think of institutions, you should act personal. It means that you need to be responsible for what happens personally, because there are individuals behind the thing, okay? Now, but you can't succeed if you all act individually without some proper coordination. That's the point. So if everybody just doing what they want, there's chaos. There are people who just infiltrate the thing. Some are insulting. Some are jumping. Some are bringing all kinds. Today, I saw a list of demands. I'm sure somebody just put it up. All kinds of demands, LGBT, all kinds of things in there. Now, there, there's a danger there. Now, if you leave it without any leader, it's fine, but you need to give it direction. So this is my, my, how I resolve it. Don't create a hierarchy. Don't create a hierarchy. Create a network. Don't, and, I, and I explain this point. You see, when you want to dominate, when you want to dominate somebody, in fact, I'll give you a nice quote. He says, power as domination is most effectively exercised through a hierarchy. Power as domination is most effectively exercised through a hierarchy. But power as empowerment is most effectively exercised through a network. So what I'm saying is that if you create an organization, Ghanaians fix Ghana, president, vice president, general secretary, it's easy to target you. Ah, this guy, he needs a Mercedes Benz. This guy, he needs this. Let's, let's, let's end it. Keep it as a network. Now, if you want to just chop a post, then you can create a group. Because that's what happened with the original one. Once you start appointing executives and everybody's taking position, it's easy to target them. Then you can organize them to become partisan. But if you keep it as a network, that's what I mean. Act personal, think institutional. If you, if you treat it as a network, if you want to empower people to do, so they can do their Kumasi version, do their Tamale version, do their UCC version of whatever you're doing, create a network. That's, in fact, we're in the era of the network. Power, we are, in, we are two quick things before this break. We are in an era of power transition and power shifts. Okay, so we are moving from state to non state actors. So, for example, US, Pearl Harbor, over 2,000 people were killed by Japan at Pearl Harbor. 
But look at Al Qaeda. It was a network. Same with, and I'm not necessarily supporting them, but just saying that there's a, diff a, a, a diffusion of power from creating this body of executives to try and control, fix the country because everybody wants a position to keeping it as a network where people will fight local issues. People in Bono have their issues. OT region have their matter. Western North, they are dealing with different things. If you keep it as a network, it's empowering. If you make it a hierarchy, you just dominate and probably destroy yourself. And finally, this is not going to be a short journey. What you've started, change doesn't come in a day. It's going to take a lot of hard work. It will probably happen after you are dead. Prepare for the long haul. And I'm, I'm very serious about this. That's why you need to strategize. It's not just making noise and getting angry. That's important. But that's just the... the, the you, see, you should be like platinum. Platinum catalyzes things, but it doesn't necessarily do everything on its own. So you should be a catalyst. When we come back, I'll spend the last few minutes to talk to the government, analyze their response, and give them some free advice. This is the point of view. It's an editorial on... Fix the country. We are live. I have some of your messages I'll read as well. Stay with us. I woke up this morning. Nothing wakes me up better than a cup of cowbell coffee. Delicious coffee aroma. Mmm. How can you forget your lines again? I'm sorry, sir, just that it tastes really good. Cowbell coffee! Enjoy the delicious creamy coffee taste of three in one cowbell coffee. It's a beautiful day. Waiting! Cowbell coffee! This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Good Day Energy Drink keeps you going. Available in major supermarkets and shops near you. Excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women, and people sensitive to caffeine. This advert is FDA approved. Welcome back to this editorial on Fix the Country. My name is Bernard Avila. Tonight we're trying to give you a quick context for this very serious social media campaign, if you want to call it that. 660,000 tweets. We've told you who the people are, why they are angry. We've tried to differentiate this and also compare and contrast with Occupy Ghana. We've given some few advice to the organizers. Now what I want to do is to talk to government. First thing I want to say to the government is that you need to respond to this. Government hasn't responded to this. We know that there have individuals who responded, so are not done praying things. But first thing, this is happening in the first year of a new government. Imagine if this was in 2019. The momentum would have even lost you an election. So I think that you should actually thank the people for starting it in 2021. Because trust me, if you look at the evolution of this, it's going to gather momentum and gather steam. Okay? They've given you three years to solve the problem. That's what I'm saying to you. It started in 2021. NDC got theirs in 20... NDC's own became serious in 2015, a year to election in Dumso. Yours is 2021. You have 2022, 2023, before 2024. So if I were you, I would start thinking about what do I do to deal with this anger that is building up on social media. So be grateful it's happening in this year, less than six months after an election. That means you can even decide that some people have appointed, I don't appoint them again. You can do so many things now. When Muhammad had it, he was in Dumso 
<laughs> I'm sure there's nothing you could do. So tech, but you didn't know what to do. You are just starting. You can say, Charlie, based on what's happening, some people cry, I have to sack some ministers and appoint some people, whatever. That's number one. Number two, number two, don't be dismissive. Don't dismiss it. Ah, some upstarts, nobody's on Facebook. We are the poor organized. This is what governments do. The anger that's building up is for political leadership who have a lot of influence. I agree, politicians don't do everything. We have civil servants, they have their problems. Ghanaian citizens have a role to play. But don't dismiss it, be discerning. What do I mean? There are people who come on air and say things, some who come and insult. A discerning mind picks the right one and deals with it. So like Henry Corte, he's doing his job. He's fixing the country. He's greater Christ than minister. Produce more people like Henry Corte. Get people to be... To, to do things to respond. So if they've, if they've listed 25 issues, you don't, you don't necessarily have to get, and get somebody to go on social media and be insulting them. Oh, don't do that. Don't dismiss it. Number three, please stop this fix yourself thing. Stop it. It's, 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 it's nauseating. Fix yourself. Should fix myself? No, please, no. That's not what we voted for you to come and do, to fix yourself, no. I think that what, this, what that does is portrays a posture of arrogance. Even if you haven't sent them, stop it. If they are doing it on their own, cry still. They are doing it in your name. It's insulting to Ghanaians. Stop it. Don't do it. Let's go to the fourth one. You have to fix the country. That's why we voted for you. You can't escape it. You can't fix everything, but you have to. You have to. You, you have to fix it. Because you said in 2016, God didn't put us here to be poor. You said you could manage the economy better. You said Muhammad was doomed so. We are not here to do any CMP politics. But a leader's response to criticism determines the quality of leader they are. Take it in good faith and start working now. Fixing the country requires all of us to play our part. We admit that. But my friend Kojo says, citizens are like the cars and the leader is the road. If the road is bad, the cars cannot move. Build a good road. They will insult you, criticize you, but do the work. Do the work of leadership. Let's stop investing in propaganda and people, paying people to go on Facebook and insult people. Do the work and let your work speak for you. That's why you are there. Do the work. Pick the ones that you know you can control. And be honest with Ghanaians. Tell us that some of the things we said, we can't do it. But the ones you can do, we'll do it and do our best. Talk to us. Stop using these upstarts to insult people and doing things. We don't need that. You are lucky it started in 2021. A word to the wise is enough. I've received your messages. I'll scroll them when I do the replay. I couldn't read them, but thank you. We all have a role to play in building Ghana, but the political leadership has to take the lead. We'll leave it here. My name is Bernard Avle. Thank you so much for watching. Click and like this video. Share it with your friend. Let's build Ghana together. We'll see you next time. Business Dashboard is next. Point of View is sponsored by First National Bank. First National Bank. How can we help you? The Point of View is brought to you by Cowbell Coffee. Cowbell Coffee. Taste it. Love it.